let's give a warm welcome to anybody, all those watching online. God bless you. We love you. We're glad you're here with us. All right. And please open your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 26 for today. And I am calling this teaching, The One Who Changes Everything. Now, this week, reading through chapter 26 and studying it, and I don't know if you know this, but I can make extensive notes. I can make so many notes in a week that I just, come time to teach, I just start cutting out notes, you know. But I didn't make hardly any notes at all today. And I'll tell you why. Because as I began to read Acts chapter 26, I just was like excited. Like this is another exciting episode and we get to watch what's going on in the life of the Apostle Paul and how he faces trials and what he does with them. And I think that that becomes a real encouragement to us because we know that not everything in life goes sweet. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Sometimes heartache comes. Sometimes things that are not understandable float our way. And unfortunately, I think that sometimes when those things come along, we're less likely sometimes to talk about the things of God. We kind of maybe close in when those hard times come. And the big encouragement to me in watching Acts chapter 26 is that Paul the Apostle doesn't let that happen to him. In fact, he uses this tremendous time of testing as an opportunity to give his testimony and to talk about the one who changed his life. He talks in such a manner as to have boasting about this great hope that he has been called to. And I need to give you a differentiation between hope in the world and hope from the Lord. Hope in the world is kind of like this. I sure hope I win the lottery. I sure hope I have enough gas to make it through the week. You know, I sure hope I get to go to Disneyland soon. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like, I hope it rains. And I really do hope it rains. It doesn't look like it. Uh, but hope in the world is very iffy. It's very chancy. But let me tell you about hope in the scriptures. Hope in the scriptures is based upon the promises of God. So hope in the scriptures is as good as gold. In fact, I would say it is better than gold. One of the definitions that I particularly like about biblical hope is that it is the anticipation of coming good. That gives it a little different feel, doesn't it? The absolute assurance of coming good because God said it and so it's going to come about. So Paul talks about hope. And my goodness, I think we all know that a little bit of hope can go a long way, yes? We need hope. The times that we are living in, and by the way, I heard somebody say again this week, welcome to the new normal. And the new normal is something like this, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Okay. Can anybody relate to that? It seems to be that that's what's coming across in the news, that's what's coming across uh, from people to each other. It's called FUD, F-U-D, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But I like it that we don't have to live in that place because God has promised that he is our father. He has promised that he will care for us. And so we trust him in that. We take all of our burdens and our worries and we lay them down at the feet of Jesus. So the big encouragement to me personally, and I want to say this because I, I know that it's true. Uh, I believe for all of us. In here, it's easy to talk about Jesus. Out there, it's a little more difficult. Yes? Sometimes it's a little more difficult on your street, on your block, with your neighbor, at your work. But this is the place where you are right now. And so consider it a full service uh, full service gas station that you're pulled into and you want to get totally filled up with the word and with the things of God and with the hope that promised that 
of God, the anticipation of coming good, that you get filled up with that in this place, and then you're able to move forward. So I thought it good that we would just walk through Acts chapter 26 together. And I hope that you have as much enjoyment as I uh, have had in studying it. Um, I look at the Apostle Paul again and I think to myself, if he can witness about Jesus Christ in the difficult place that he's in, then what holds me back from the good place that we're in? If with all the disruption that has happened in his life over the last two years, and being in jail, being in cuffs, and people threatening to kill him, if he can still use that as an opportunity time to speak about his Lord who has so dramatically changed his life, then what about me? What about us? Join me in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I pray, Heavenly Father, that today would be a, a time of encouragement, a time of hope, a time of challenge, a time of appreciation, Lord, for our being able to look into the life of a brother in Christ who is totally sold out for you. So bless this time, Lord. Use it as a great encouragement. For we ask this in Jesus' precious name. And everybody says, Amen. All right, here's the Apostle Paul. He is currently in a trial, a, a literal trial. He, he's on trial. And he is facing Roman guards. And he is facing a king by the name of Agrippa. And he is facing a procurator, which is kind of like a governor. And uh, he is facing all of the people, the prominent people in the city like going to city council. And he's facing a bunch of Jewish brothers that he grew up with in Christ, uh, in the word, not in Christ. And they are hating him. That's the situation that we're in as we begin reading in Acts chapter 26. Verse 1. Then Agrippa, that's the king, said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I, I like that. He is, and we'll see this in, an, in another place too in the chapter, that he actually gives respect and honor to positions. Not necessarily to people, but he gives respect and honor to positions. And I, I've been working through this in my own heart and mind when it comes to, you know, some of the... Uh, decisions perhaps that we're seeing that are being made politically that we may or may not disagree with but uh, I'm looking at Paul and I'm thinking okay he realizes that there is a greater kingdom than the little kingdom of King Agrippa that he is involved in at this point he is realizing as Jesus said to Pilate if you will recall he said you would have no authority unless my father had given it to you so I look at some things that are happening. Perhaps I don't think they're right. Perhaps I don't think they're biblical. But yet we still give proper respect for positions. And I think we'll take a look at that. I, I don't find, you know, they wanted Jesus to be a political leader. And he flat out did not want to do that. Um, I look at other people in the scriptures that he wanted to be flat out. They wanted... They wanted Peter to, you know, to come against the Romans. And he flat out rejected that. We, we're of a different kingdom. Y'all realize that, don't you? Uh, that this is not our home. That, that our home is with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the reason that we're here right now, and we're going to find out that as the Lord speaks to the Apostle Paul, but we're going to find out that we are here right now to be servants and witnesses of Jesus Christ in this world so that others might have the same, come to the same understanding and faith in God that we have. That, that's the picture. So Paul, it says, stretches out his hand. And, and apparently that is a sign of respect. And you could picture him almost as a lawyer, but he's speaking for himself. And he says, well, kind of like men and brethren kind of thing. 
So let's see what he says. I, verse 2, I think myself happy, King Agrippa. All right, let me stop right there. <laughs> Did anybody consider they would say this? What would you be saying? Or what would you be singing? I know what I'd be singing. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. <laughs> but he says, I am happy. And this is that attitude that the Apostle Paul has. That he can take a test and turn it into a testimony. That he can be faced with trouble and see it as an opportunity to speak about Christ. I don't know that we do that. I believe that we should. I wish that I did that more often, you know, don't you? <laughs> that I could actually, in the midst of trouble, bless somebody else's life or go through a difficulty, something that is so pressing, and yet other people would look at me and say, man, I don't know how you're keeping a smile on your face. I don't know how you have that peace when this tragedy has just happened in your life. That's a testimony of God's spirit working within you. So I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews. He was accused of uh, maligning them of maligning the temple of uh, profaning the temple all the things that you know the apostle paul would be absolutely against are the very things that they are condemning him for uh, they want the opportunity to kill him and indeed that some of them have even taken an oath that they won't eat or drink until he's dead so this is a pretty uh, hefty trial that he's in. And here's why he says again why he is happy. Verse 3, especially because you, King Agrippa, are an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. So it's interesting that he understands who King Agrippa is as uh, he's a bad dude. <laughs> he's caused a lot of death. He's a terrible king. But at the same time, he is part Jewish. And he has a certain fascination about the Jewish customs and about the word of God. And so you can understand then that at Paul stands before him, he is looking at somebody who knows that 30 years before this time, Christ was on earth. He's heard of all the miracles. He has heard of his resurrection. He has heard of him being seen after his resurrection. He has heard of his ascension into heaven and his promise to return. He knows it all. He knows all of this. And so Paul, I think, is looking at him as a wonderful opportunity. How about this? As a target of his love. What's the best thing that you could want for anybody in the world, whether they're friend or foe? That they would come to know Jesus. If your worst enemy can come to know Jesus, then they're going to love you. <laughs> and you love them right back. So Paul, I believe, looks at everybody as an opportunity to share God's love with. Because for God so loved the world, and I know we look at the world sometimes and we think it seems to be getting more evil, it seems to be getting more violent, especially lately, it seems to be getting less grace and more anger, and you go, wow, Lord, this is a tough place to love, you know. Uh, but you have to remind yourself that God so loved you. And I, I sometimes ponder that for myself. That in God's mind, in the mind of God, he thought about you. And he saw you as a target of his love. And of his grace and of his mercy. He didn't leave you out of any of his thoughts. In fact, in the Psalms, David writes, 
if we could count all the thoughts that God has for you, they would number more than the grains of sand in the sea. God thinks about us a whole lot. And when he thinks about us, it's with love and not to condemn us. And the Bible further says, let this same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And so Paul the Apostle, I believe, is doing that. I think maybe others would stand before King Agrippa and they would shout about their innocence. <laughs> I'm innocent, and yet I've been beaten, and this is my fourth defense of myself and how dare you do that and I already told you I'm a Roman citizen you need to get me out of here and they want to do dirty to me right wouldn't we would probably do something like that but not Paul again he's looking at every single thing as an opportunity to bring in the love of God no matter what the situation when you're standing in line at the grocery store you know uh, my wife has this uh She's very good at this. She'll, we'll, we'll go into a grocery store, where, by the way, I'm thankful to God there are still groceries, and uh, she will ask the Lord, as she looks around the store, Lord, who is it that you want me to pray for? And she'll zero in on somebody and say, I'm praying for that one right now. We'll walk down the aisles, but she's praying for that. And a lot of times we end up in the same row at the checkout, where she has an opportunity to talk to her and and uh, share with her some love and sometimes a card from church or devotional life, you know. That's what we're to do. Rather than looking at everybody as an obstacle and looking at people and cars on the freeway and my boss at work, you know. Oh, I just want to avoid all that, you know. Rather than trying to turn the test into a testimony. So he says, you're especially, I'm glad to talk in front of you. I'm happy about it, King Agrippa, because you are an expert in the customs and the questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. Hear me out. Verse 4, he begins. My manner of life from my youth. Now remember, the Apostle Paul used to run the streets of Jerusalem as a kid. And when he got into, you know, training in the word of God, he can say, I know that some of you folks that are here, the Jews that are there to condemn him, I went to school with you. <laughs> Don't you remember me? We were together in class. You know, he's relating to them in a sense. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning, among my own nation at Jerusalem. All the Jews know. All you Jews that are here to condemn me. You all know this. They knew me from the first. If they were willing to testify. That according to the strictest sect of our religion. I lived a Pharisee. Pharisees. Oh my goodness. They memorized large portions of scripture. They lived the Mosaic law as absolutely best they could. They were strict about everything. What's your testimony of growing up? I can tell you a little bit about mine. I consider myself having been raised in the church so to speak and uh, catechism class I had the questions memorized and the answers uh, first holy communion um, bowing before the saints in the church confession with the priest I knew all these things but I didn't know the Lord Paul the Apostle speaking about his history growing up. I knew a lot. I knew, uh, you guys know me. I knew tons, but didn't know the Lord. And I think that there are some today in the church that we call dating God. You're willing to date God. What's that look like? I know there's a God. I know he's probably real. I mean, 
likely there is this higher being, likely somebody had to be involved in creation. That's called dating God. I know a lot, or today, in, in colloquial terms, <laughs> colloquial, colloquial terms, is that right, Miss Judy? Miss Judy's a teacher and she helps me. People like to say, I'm spiritual. I'm not religious. Oh my gosh, don't say that. But I am spiritual. Well, what does spiritual mean? Again, it's just dating God. Paul is talking about dating God from the time that he was young. I knew the scriptures. Uh, I, could, I, could, I got some of them memorized. I could tell you these things. But did I actually know Jesus walking with me? Interesting. Verse 6 says, and now I stand and am judged. Look what he's judged for. He's judged for the hope. There's that word hope that I began pulling out of this chapter. That hope which rests upon the certainty of God's word. Look, when God speaks, he bats a thousand. Everything he says comes to pass just the way he said it. Shouldn't I rely upon that? Shouldn't I put my hope upon that? Because it becomes a living hope and not a perchance, you know. He says, I'm being judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. What's the promise? He says, I'll be judged based on the, what promise is he talking about? What hope and what promise? He's talking about what every Jew has been waiting for, for thousands and thousands of years. They're waiting for the coming Messiah. And Paul is saying, he's come. He came. He lived. He died for our sins. He was put in a grave and he rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and he's coming back. There it is right there. That's what's going on. Because I'm looking at a group of you guys. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm like you. I'm waiting for the same promise, the same hope. We have the same hope, but I'm telling you, it's Jesus. And if you take all the things that were promised about the Messiah in the Old Testament, there's only one person that fills, fits the bill. And that's Jesus. Undeniable. It points squarely at him. But these people don't want to give up place. And they don't want to give up position. And they don't want to... The deceitfulness of riches. Chokes people out, doesn't it? And... Guess what? In a sense, it still chokes people out today. Hey, look, if there's a God, and I got an answer to him, no, 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 I don't want to think about that. But there is a God. And folks, everyone will stand before him. But know now that he loves you. And he's willing to forgive all of your sins. That's the God we know. That's the God that Paul is speaking of. That's the hope that was promised, made by God to our fathers. Verse 7, to this promise are 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. They're waiting for this. For this hope's sake... King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? I, I really like that question. And tell me, uh, Paul is bold, isn't he? And he's not holding back. And I want you to think for a moment. Who do you think you could stand in front of with boldness that doesn't know God and say to them, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? God gave life. God made life. God raised the dead. Why is that so impossible to think? Uh, the other day I was watching, I was telling Jeannie, I was watching this uh, show. 
and uh, it was a show about the pyramids in Egypt. That's fascinating stuff to me. And uh, they talked about the fact that the uh, pyramids were at one point, they were all covered, you know, with this white. So they were bright white. And that is all, you know, washed away. But they have mathematicians out there, and this guy's going off about, you know, it's not even off, it's less than an inch, you know. And the math that it took to do this, and the manpower that it took to, we still can't figure out today. These guys were geniuses, and they had a human understanding that nobody could understand. How in the world could they build a pyramid in the middle of the desert? And he's just going off. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty fantastic. And I thought to myself, you are so close to understanding that God created. Pick up anything, a blade of grass. <laughs> Pick up anything, <laughs> you know, a fly <laughs> or a bumblebee that shouldn't be able to fly. <laughs> Who designed that thing? Who put it there? You know, it... You know that we're sending people, we're gonna, Elon's gonna send another group of people to the moon. I don't know if you've heard that. NASA asked him if they would, he would do another moon flight and he said, yeah, nothing to it. Uh, and to Mars, you know. Let's just suppose that, uh, let's just suppose, uh, you know, somebody does finally end up on Mars and they jump out of the spacecraft and uh, they're walking around and they look down at the ground, and on the ground there is a red brick. Do you think they would say that red brick that is exactly the same dimensions as the red bricks here on the United, in, in, here in, on Earth, that red brick was an accident? It just happened. Well, let's take it even a step further. They jump out of the, out of the uh, uh, craft, they're walking around, and laying on the ground is a Rolex watch. Do <laughs> you think somebody would say that just happened by accident? And yet how further complex are you than a Rolex watch? Well beyond that. Do you think you're an accident? God knows you. He knows your name. He knows the perfect plans that he has for your life. And Paul the Apostle is talking about his life growing up and what he knows and what he did and how earnest he was about it. But yet all of his religiousness was absent the very presence of God. But he says... Why should it be thought impossible by you that God raises the dead? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 5, the Apostle Paul writes this. He, Jesus, was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present but some has fallen asleep. That means at the time that Paul wrote this is approximately the same time that this is going on. There are still people alive at the time the Apostle Paul is speaking that actually saw Jesus after his resurrection. Verse 7, after that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all he was seen by me. Listen, the hinge pin of your faith and of my faith rests upon the resurrection. And if the resurrection did not take place, Paul muses in another place in the scripture, it says, if the resurrection did not take place, we are still dead in our sin and without hope before a holy God. But you could be filled with hope today because your hope is not rested upon if maybe could only, I wish it could, upon a star. <laughs> 
Your hope rests upon the promise of God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And why do you think it should be thought of as a strange thing that God could... Can I tell you what? The one, there is one scripture in the Bible. If you can jump over this with your faith, and Jesus says it only takes the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed that there is. If you could get over this one verse in the Bible, then the rest of it becomes very easy. If you could get over this one verse in the Bible, then the flood, the big fish <laughs> that swallowed Jonah, the, the uh, plagues of Egypt, the coming of the Son of God, his resurrection, are all a piece of cake. And that one verse is found at the very start of the Bible. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created. That's it. You could say yes to that in your heart of hearts. The rest of it becomes a piece of cake. An enjoyable experience in every regard. Author Lee Strobel, I know some of you are familiar with him. He wrote this. If we were holding a trial to determine the facts concerning the resurrection. By the way, Lee Strobel started out an atheist until he decided to debunk the resurrection. But he said, if we were holding a trial to determine the facts concerning the resurrection, and if we're called to the witness stand, every witness who personally encountered the resurrected Jesus and we cross-examined them, and for only 15 minutes each. And if we went around the clock without a break, we would be listening to first-hand testimonies for more than 128 hours. That's over five days' worth of consecutive testimony. Who could possibly walk away unconvinced? Look at verse 9. Uh, I, I, uh, th consider this as we start in verse 9. Paul is going to be absolutely uh, honest about his life prior to his encounter with the risen Savior. And sometimes we like to clean things up, you know? And talk about how wonderful we were when we were young, you know. And I can't do that. You want to know why? Because my mom's here. And she would, <laughs> she would call me out if I tried to do that. But I want you to know in going into this that we're real people here. You can be real here. And we're all on the road together in growing in Christ. And if anything, I could say like the Apostle Paul, here stands a chief sinner, which is what he did say about himself. We're all growing in Christ. We're all learning. We're all maturing in Christ together. Listen to what he said. Indeed, I myself thought, so here was his thinking at one time, I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> here's another thought you can have you think of anybody that you know that doesn't walk with the Lord and you think they are the heart I know the hardest case there is I know somebody who would never give their life to Christ they are the original hard case well Paul the Apostle is a hard case and don't you love it that God can pull out any folder with anybody's name and put it on the top of his desk and just target you with his love and can turn even the hardest case around. Contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, this I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. He might have even pointed to them. You guys gave me the authority to do this. 
And when they had, and when they, notice the word they, when they were put to death, who was the first martyr? Stephen. Stephen, but apparently there were more martyrs than that. We don't know how many. The Bible doesn't tell us. But to begin with, Paul started the parade with Stephen. He says, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. This is one of the ways in which we know that Paul the Apostle was part of the ruling council of the Sanhedrin. And that is because the, the process by which they made decisions were those that were in the ruling council were given these different colored stones. And they would take votes, they would cast their stone. And you would count up how many votes per how many stones were cast. So Paul says, I cast my vote against them and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So Paul's kind of looking at these guys, the Jews that are against him. And he's saying, the very thing that you want to do to me is the very thing you once gave me authority to do when I was with you. He is talking about his own sins, but he's pointing out their sins as well. So that comes into play when we're talking to people. Don't, don't ever come off as some kind of a holier than thou. Look, I prove every day that I need a savior. Amen. Is anybody else with me on that? You know, I, I go to bed and lay in bed at night and I say, oh Lord Jesus, I proved it again, didn't I? <laughs> How much I need you. And when Satan comes along with his lies, which he will, and his lies go something like this, you call yourself a believer. You know, he, he is called the accuser of the brethren. So he's going to accuse you day and night. You don't belong in church. Those people are more loving than you. And, and you don't deserve it. And you know what you could do? You could go, I know I am a sinner. <laughs> I know I don't deserve. It's all by the grace of God. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. And he'll walk away disgusted. But you'll be happy. So Paul the Apostle is talking about his life, and then he's going to switch, and he's going to say, he's going to say, something happened, though. I had an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus is the one who changes everything. You think you'd be sitting here if it wasn't for Jesus? <laughs> Who knows what crazy thing we'd be doing <laughs> if it wasn't for Jesus? And so he's going to have an encounter with Jesus, and Jesus is the one that changes everything. Verse 12. While thus occupied <laughs> with rubbing out Christianity, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority, I had papers, I had authority, and commissioned from the chief priests, these guys sitting over here, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me, and those who journeyed with me, and when we all had fallen to the ground. I don't know how many people he had with him. But he had enough people with him to arrest. He had enough people with him to intimidate. He had enough people with him to throw in prison. So he's traveling with a group of people. And it says this light was so bright that everybody fell down. This is something out of the realm of the natural. This is something very supernatural. It is a bright light. The only thing I could think of was, you ever walk out of a theater at noon? <laughs> and you're just like, whoa! <laughs> you know, you're like, what is this? But this light is Jesus himself. You say, well, Paul, how do you know that? Who here remembers the account of the transfiguration of Jesus? 
It says he shone brightly. That brightness in Christ was always there. I think the rest of the time it was just muted for our sakes. But on the Mount of Transfiguration, boom, here's who I am, bright light. John chapter 1 tells us that a light has come into the world. And no wonder people say, you know, I was blind, but now I see. We stumble around in this life. It looks random to us. How could that happen? Why did this go that way? Why is that? In the world, we think it random. It's not random. All of these things in history, in our time today, as you look around the world, it all points to the coming of Christ. We've got to see that, church family. We don't know the exact date that Christ returns, but we certainly are to know the times and the seasons. Jesus said there'd be wars and rumors of wars. Jesus said there would be pestilence. <laughs> We're looking at such things. But don't be afraid. We were told these things are coming. We were told we'd be taken care of. We were told that he would come back and get us. That's our hope. Midday, bright light all around. Everybody falls to the ground. I heard a voice speaking to me and saying to me in the Hebrew language. So Paul understands that. Saul, Saul. Or... In Hebrew, it would be Shaul, Shaul. <laughs> Jesus knows you. And he wants you to know his voice. He wants you to be personally so familiar with the way that he speaks. With the way that he looks at things. From his perspective. See, we all have a perspective, don't we? Some perspective that we fall into and we're comfortable with. We have a perspective about everything, about people, about life, about work. It's our perspective. We've earned it. We've developed it over the years. And I don't want to leave my perspective. And you see people now today having their perspective and not wanting to break out of their perspective in order to get into God's perspective. So today with the young people, I mean, it's always been this way, but I don't know. It's, it's a lot worse now. <laughs> Sexually, a lot of the young people have a perspective. Doesn't mean anything to move in with somebody. Doesn't mean anything not to get married. Doesn't mean anything to have sex with whoever. That's the first thing you do. You want to try it out. See if it works. That's a perspective. And a lot of young people are saying, I don't care what the Bible says, I'm keeping my perspective. Or when it comes to drugs and alcohol. Hey, marijuana is now legal. I've got that perspective. So does everybody else. Don't be a square. It's legal. You can grow your own. It's okay. So they've got their perspective. And I don't want to leave my perspective. I don't care what the word of God says. But you cannot play both sides of the fence. Pick, choose, as Joshua said. Choose this day whom you will serve. If it's the world, have at it. If it's the Lord, then as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So something is happening in this encounter that Paul is having right now with Jesus. We're standing right in the middle of it. Maybe you have had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've had an encounter with Christ here in this place or someplace else. And I remember years ago when I was, uh, Ralph and I were out to, to breakfast. And I don't know how I got on it, but I started talking about, uh, there was a time in my life uh, where the Lord grabbed a hold of me with, with both hands. And I almost felt like, I don't know if it's the right word, but it's like heavy, you know? Like I felt God's hand on my head, you know? And I knew he was there and I knew he was working. And, and, and he was like, I've, I, I sensed in my arm, 
what's going on with you right now, Paul, is not, not where you're going to be. It's not, it's not what I want for you. And I was working at the time, and I was having a good career, and I was looking for my next promotion. <laughs> and uh, I owned a couple of houses, and, you know, I was like, yeah, this is it, you know? And, uh, and yet at the same time, I was feeling, how futile is all this? Just doesn't mean anything, you know? And I was like, what is going on? And every place I began to turn, I ran into the Lord. If I, if I turned on the radio, somehow it would be on a Christian station and there would be somebody talking or singing about the Lord. And I, could, I developed this incredible thirst for the things of God. And the word of God became so precious to me. And the, word of, the worship of God begins to be so precious for me. And honestly, I... I, I hated this, but I found myself crying all the time. <laughs> you know? I would hear a worship song, you know? I love you, Lord. <laughs> and I would just be like, I do love you, Lord. <laughs> and, and it was like I felt the heaviness of God's hand upon me. And it was an encounter that I had with God. And from that time, I brought me to a place where I said, I'm not turning back. Not for nothing. And I even remember in my prayer life, you know, I said, Lord, I want you to, to take a barrel, fill it with cement, and drop me into it because I'm not moving. I will not move from you, Lord. Maybe you've had an encounter with the Lord. Maybe you have something that you remember where you met up with Jesus. And he has a way of changing everything. He changes things. Let's see what happens to the Apostle Paul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Did Paul think that he was persecuting Jesus? He did it. I, I would think that even he'd have a question. What do you mean persecuting you? This shows you how much Jesus identifies with you. You may have had some hardship in your life and you have, may have been sitting alone and you may have felt that you were forgotten. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus was there next to you by the power of the Holy Spirit, hurting with you, crying with you. I find it remarkable that in the scriptures, Jesus connects with people in their hurt and their anguish. Listen to me. There's a lot of broken people in this world. Maybe there are parts of your life where you're broken. Jesus is with you right now, right here, in this place, in the hearing of his word. And he'll hurt there right with you. Why are you persecuting me? And then he says, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. You ever heard that term when somebody say, boy, that guy was really goading me. You ever heard that? Just goading me, you know? It's, it's got the sense of pushing me, you know? Kind of like harassing me, you know? That person was just goading me, you know? We, if you remember back from Acts chapter 9, we discussed what a goad is. It's a long stick with a pointed end. Sometimes with a nail at the end of it. And if you had a particular livestock that didn't want to move, what would you do with that long pointed stick? I, I think that there are folks today that God has been trying to get through to. And you're stubborn. Oh, Lord, why are you doing that to me? Oh, why is it the same trial over and over again in my life? It's because he loves you. Don't, don't you want a God who would say to you, uh, don't go that way, it's going to hurt. I, I would love that. I, I do love that. <laughs> he does do that, doesn't he? 
somebody told me that uh, in his life, this is the way God operated or operates. I haven't talked to him for a few years. But he says, you know, I feel like when God doesn't want me to do something, he says, uh, he says to me, uh, hey, come here for a moment. I want to I uh, take a walk with me. I'm going to buy you an ice cream. Oh, good, Lord. And you sit down with the Lord, and he buys you an ice cream, and you're sitting there. And he's going, you know, uh, the thing that you're doing is not going to turn out well. So I just wanted to sit and talk with you and, and uh, have an ice cream with you. You just kind of go, yeah, thanks, Lord. Very cool. Then you go off again, doing the same dumb thing. You know it's a dumb thing. The Lord knows it's a dumb thing. And the Lord goes, hey, come here. I, I, I need to have a talk with you. And you're like, oh, goody, ice cream. And the Lord says, yeah, I'm, I'm going to buy you an ice cream. You sit down, licking your ice cream. But he's a little more stern this time. And he says, stop it. I'm just going to tell you right now, stop it. It's not good for you, not good for the people you love. Knock it off. And you go, oh, okay, Lord, you don't have to, you know, gee. And off you go. You do the same dumb thing again. The Lord says, <clears throat> come here. And you're like, another ice cream? And this time he says, the Lord says, we're not going to the ice cream parlor. We're going to the woodshed. <laughs> I, I used to, in my, in my earlier walk, I used to say, oh, Lord, I want to do this. Please say yes. Let me do this. Say yes. Say yes, Lord. Say, come on, Lord. Let this be. I want to do this. I want to go there. You know, whatever. <clears throat> you know what now I appreciate more than the yeses? I appreciate the noes. I love the nose of God because he knows. And I love his nose. What's that old show, Father Knows Best? <laughs> Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goad. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. Remember, Jesus wants you to know who he is. He wants you to know his voice. He wants you to become familiar with his perspective, not yours. With a heavenly perspective rather than an earthbound perspective. Whom you are persecuting totally connects with us. He's the head and we're the body. Somebody steps on your foot, your head knows it. Verse 16. But rise and stand on your feet. Can you imagine being able to stand before God? This is, this is God in human flesh. And he says, stand before me. Rise, stand before me. That's beautiful. Not everybody will stand before the Lord. For I have appeared to you for this purpose. Oh, Let's find out what the purposes of God when he encounters somebody. Here it is. For I have appeared to you for this purpose to make you a minister and a witness. The word minister is, it's the word waiter or waitress. It's the word servant. You know, we've turned minister into this lofty term, you know. Are you a minister? Are you a waiter? He's turned you into a servant and a witness. That's what we should be signing up for, to be servants and witnesses. To serve God and to serve other people, and I remember that plainly in my life. Lord, I want to see people grow in you. I want to help people. I want to touch people's lives for you. Because here's the, here, here it is. Watch this. If you have had an encounter with Jesus, 
then you are to become an encounter of Jesus to other people. You now become the catalyst of encounters for other people to have with Jesus. Because you're a, you're a servant and you're a witness. What does a witness do? So you, you, we have to consider that we're being put on the stand for Jesus every day. If, I, if this was a courtroom, Judge Judy, and no, <laughs> there's a judge and, and there's the witness and you take the witness. Swear to you, promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, I do. Tell me about your relationship with Jesus. Absolutely honest. Like Paul the Apostle is being absolutely honest here. A witness, most of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. Good things are coming. That's hope right there. Verse 17, I will deliver you from the Jewish people that he's standing in front of. And he's like, God's going to deliver me from you. Jesus just said it. As well as from the Gentiles, that's the Roman guards there, to whom I now send you. So he's being sent to Rome. We're going to watch Paul go to Rome in the next couple of chapters. He'll finally make it. Um, which tells me and tells you again, you're invincible until your service and your witness to Christ is completed. And then it's time for you to go home. Verse 18, to open their eyes. You're, my goodness, Paul, look, we're having an eye-opening experience right now. <laughs> Paul the Apostle is giving to us an eye-opening experience, and we're to give that same eye-opening experience to other people by being a servant and a witness, by telling those things that we have seen about Christ and, and being ready to share the things that God is maybe even giving to us today, maybe even right now, with other people. Watch this. This comes in four parts. This is the prayer you pray for the people you know and love who are not yet following Christ. Watch this. To open their eyes in order to, number one, turn them from darkness to light. And number two, from the power of Satan to God. Number three, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. And number four, an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. You wonder what to pray for somebody you know and love that does not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe it's a relative, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's your children who are not yet walking with the Lord. Maybe all they have is a head knowledge and it is not yet translated to their lives in how they live, then here's where you pray. You pray the will of God over their lives. And the will of God is this right here. Maybe you're living in a roommate situation and the people you're living with don't know the Lord. What do you pray? Father, put it, let's pray right now, shall we? Let's pray, let's pray. Who, think up in your mind somebody that you would love to see come to Jesus. Faith in Jesus. Well, so this is how we do it. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we're praying for this one or this group of people. And we are asking you, Lord, because it's your will, that you would turn them from darkness to light. And we further pray, Lord, that you would turn them from the power of Satan. He seems to have control over them, Lord. But Father, we're asking that you would bring them under the power of God and break the work of Satan in their lives. And then number three, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. Father, we want their sins washed away. Father, we love these people. We don't want to see them stand in judgment for their sins when Christ has already paid for them. Father, bring them to a place where they receive forgiveness of sins. And then fourth, Lord, we want them to have an inheritance. That's heaven. 
They, we want them to have an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in you. Let's talk about that word sanctified. It sounds like another real Christian term. The word sanctified only means set apart. That's all it means, set apart. Are you sanctified? <laughs> if we were to take your time, your energy, and your resources and ask if they're sanctified, in other words, God is in control of them. They're being used for godly purposes to bless your family and bless your kids, bless your church family, used for God's glory, you know? That's the idea of sanctified. I want every part of myself sanctified. I want every part set apart for Christ. Lord, what are we going to do with this? And what are we going to do with this time? Is your time sanctified? Are your prayers, are your thoughts sanctified? It's, it's an ongoing process. Sanctification doesn't happen all at once. You know, it's said that the, uh, the making of a, let's see, the... The miracle of salvation, it, no, salvation is the miracle of a moment, the moment you put your faith in Christ. But the making of a saint is the work of a lifetime. <laughs> I think that's great there. Okay, how are we doing time-wise? Let me just finish this, okay? This is now, we're going to jump to after Paul's conversion. I'm just going to read through this. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. That's the calling, the promises, the words of Christ to be a minister and witness. I was not disobedient to the heavenly calling. Don't you be disobedient to the same heavenly calling. Verse 20, but declared first to those in Damascus and then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting of repentance. You know, the only way you could tell if you're a Christian is if you're living like a Christian. You know? <laughs> is there fruit in your life? You know? If I said I have an apple tree, and I've had it for 20 years, and you say, have you ever got any apples off of it? And I say, no, I haven't. You would say, well, maybe that's not an apple tree. <laughs> right? Same with believers. I've been a Christian for 20 years. You got any fruit in your life? No. Have you had an encounter with Jesus? You can have an encounter with Jesus today. Right now. Verse 21, for these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having uh, obtained help from God, to this day I stand. Oh, is that, is that all of our testimony? Watch this. Having obtained help from God, to this day I stand. That's, that's, that's my story. This is my story. This is my song. Witnessing both to small and great. I'm not a respecter of persons. Anybody God puts in front of me, I'm going to share the, share the love of God and the gospel of God if he gives me the opportunity. Saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. Just quoting scripture. That the Christ would suffer. That he would be the first to rise from the dead. And would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. This is pretty convincing stuff that Paul is giving here. Beautiful testimony. And he's giving it to King Agrippa who understands these concepts. So watch what happens next. This is like reaching a crescendo. Verse 24. Now as he thus made his defense, Festus, that's the governor, said in a loud voice, Paul, you're beside yourself. <laughs> Much learning has driven you mad. In other words, you're crazy, man. You, you're, you're off your rocker. You have an elevator, but it doesn't go to the top floor. You're one banana shy of a banana split. <laughs> you know those sayings. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> he says you're crazy. Guess what, people? People are going to think you're crazy. You, you put faith in Jesus Christ? You go to church every Sunday? You, you follow Jesus? You're crazy. Do never, don't, don't worry about that. Don't let it phase you. Let's see what it does to the Apostle Paul. But Paul said, I'm not mad, most notable Festus. Notice how he puts those two together. This is again interesting again. He's respectful. I'm not mad, most notable, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. See, he's targeted Agrippa, hasn't he? He's trying to get Agrippa saved. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention. Since this thing was not done in a corner. See, it's all out in the open. And we're to be open about our faith as well. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Almost. Again, I believe that there are a lot of almost Christians who are just dating God but have not married their faith to him. Verse 29, Paul said, I would to God that not only you but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am except for these chains. When he had said these things, the king stood up. He's like, I, I can't hear anymore. As well as the governor and Bernice. We talked about that last time, didn't we? And those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. In other words, they're saying Paul is innocent. Guess what you are once you put faith in Jesus Christ? Innocent. You'll stand before God Almighty on the day of judgment. And there will be no record of any sin. Because all the sins of those who believe were nailed to the cross of Calvary. Jesus paid it all. Verse 32, then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. We'll get more into that next week. Is this exciting stuff? It's like, wow. And then the, so awesome that it di relates directly to our lives. Uh, let's stand and pray. And uh, maybe I can get a couple of prayer team people up here. Matt, why don't you come on up here? And uh, maybe uh, Miss Judy, if you could come up here as well. Look, uh, if you need, maybe your encounter with Jesus Christ has gotten a little dusty. It can happen. Then, then I want you to pray. And, and we have a couple of the prayer team people up here after the service. Nobody's going to bug you. Nobody's going to be watching you or recording you. This is strictly between you and the Lord. And you can find out that you could have an encounter with God today. Let's pray. Father, it's in Jesus' wonderful name that we're before you now. Thanking you for your golden word. For your living word. Thank you, Jesus, because you are the one who changes everything. You turn our lives right side up. You break the power of the enemy. You set us free out of darkness and into your beautiful light, Lord. Lord, do that today. Both those that are here and the online church as well. For we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name and everyone says.